Chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps or nasal polyp syndrome, as it has been recently called, is an incredibly debilitating disorder which manifests in different ways in different patients. Until now, disease severity has been assessed using a wide range of subjective and objective assessment tools. But what patients and clinicians really need is a standardised assessment tool for diagnosis and monitoring of treatment. But how easy is that to achieve? Or is it a pipe dream? This is Euphoria News broadcasting from London. Hello and welcome to Euphoria News. I'm Dr. David Bull. Chronic rhinosinusitis is an inflammatory disorder of the nose and paranasal sinuses attributed to multiple underlying factors and often leading to chronic sinonasal manifestations. The presence of two or more cardinal symptoms such as nasal obstruction, facial pain and pressure, thick nasal discharge, reduced or loss of sense of smell and an inflamed sinus that lasts for at least 12 weeks is diagnostic. There is no doubt that chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps significantly impacts patients' quality of life and therefore it is crucial to have a timely diagnosis and implement the correct therapy as soon as possible. Instead of relying on a wide range of subjective and objective assessment tools, the gold standard in care would be to develop a standardised assessment tool that facilitates diagnosis, that provides uniform patient monitoring, and the ability to compare different treatment outcomes between different centres in clinical practice and also in research. Now, to that end, the Nasal Polyp Patient Assessment Scoring Sheet, or NPAS, was developed. The idea behind it was to identify patient-reported and physician-assessed components to comprehensively assess disease status and the patient's response to treatment with the end goal to improve patient care. Well, here to tell us more, I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Philippe Hevard, who is Professor of Rhinology and Allergy in the Department of Otorhinolaryngology at Ghent University in Belgium. He's also a Euphoria Rhinitis expert panel member. Really good to talk to you. Let's start, if we can, by talking about the current assessment tools, both subjective and, of course, objective as well. In your view, what are the problems with these? Well, I think we have... Uh, several good uh, tools. Uh, the, the plan here was to check or, or choose those that are the most relevant for uh, everywhere in the world and make a pre-selection uh, for ease of the medical doctor who is uh, the, the ENT surgeon who is doing practice in his everyday clinic. So, so just in terms of that, you've got objective and subjective uh, assessments there. The challenge, though, I suppose, is to turn that into a gold standard. So how big is the challenge and how do we then attain that gold standard? So you have objective ones and objective forms are, for example, the nasal polyp score. You look in the nose, you uh, have a score, you, you look how big the polyps are, how small they are, and then you give a score and that, that's objective. The subjective one is the patient tells you, I have a lot of smell, I have not a lot of smell, I have a lot of... Um, nasal obstruction, I don't have nasal obstruction, that's subjective. Um, the good thing is that uh, you have subjective and objective, but the bad thing is that they are not always aligned with each other. So sometimes the nasal polyp score can be really bad and the symptoms are not that bad or the other way around. And, and so I suppose that really underpins the development of this n pass. Just talk us through that. Yeah, so for the NPAS tool, we were sitting together with several doctors actually from the Middle East because they had the first access to biologicals. And they asked me, what are the minimal criteria we need to assess um, for judging whether a patient will go on a biological or not and for follow-up? So I said the nasal polyp score is important, symptoms is important, comorbidity is important, uh, the SNOT-22 is important. And, and then we put them just in a two-pager. A two-pager, very easy uh, for doctors so that they can use it. The main issue here is that we try to make doctors speak the same language all over the world. 
if they talk about polyps and they all use this polyp score, we all know that they use the same language, they use the same score. So it's very easy to compare their findings with each other. And those scores were used all over all the clinical trials. So that was the main objective, make a two pager for every doctor so that everyone uses the same language to compare their findings. Now, it seems uh, very simple, or the way that you put it, it sounds straightforward, but the development of NPAS was actually quite complex, wasn't it? The number of people you had involved, the sort of tools you looked at. Um, it had to be easy to use, as you say. Well, it, it, was, it was not complex. It grew organically at the start of the whole project. We had not the intent to write a paper. However, it was after several rounds sitting together that we thought, well, maybe it's a good idea to validate it with several key opinion leaders and make a more official international tool. So it grew organically from a local Middle East initiative to a global initiative uh, on the pod making it. Um, that's how most things work. And so just in terms of the development, there must have been criteria that you looked at initially, then you included them, you excluded some. So just talk us through that process. Yeah, so in the beginning, we, we lined up all the objective and subject assessment criteria, and we said, what do we need? And then we uh, proposed those criteria to uh, key opinion leaders, and we asked their advice how important they are and which we should have in and which we should not have in. And so then based with this uh, group of international experts, we selected the most important ones to come in the assessment tool. And what were the most important ones? The nasal polyp score, the SNOT22, symptom scores with the VAS scale, uh, comorbidities like asthma and ERD, um, also, in blood, for example, you can look for eosinophils to, to see whether it's type 2 or not, IgE measurements. Uh, and, and optionally, if you have it, but that's not required, you can also have a CT scan where you can look how, how, how much of the CT is filled with uh, nasal polyps. So the development of NPAS seems very straightforward. It seems like a very simple idea. Did you have support from around the world to develop it? Well, it started in the Middle East because there they had the first access to biologicals. But then uh, after that, we expanded to uh, key opinion leaders of around the world. So, for example, Claire Hopkins from London joined us uh, because she is actually she was the one uh, involved in creating the SNOT22. How, how do you see the NPAS being implemented in routine care? Are there any obstacles to the implementation or, or do you see it as fairly straightforward? Well, it's so that it's a two-pager, but you can implement these things in your electronic medical record yourself. As we have used all the outcomes that are used in the clinical trials, also most of the countries, when they have reimbursement criteria, they use already the same criteria or the same uh, objectives and subjective scores. So in a way, it's quite easy because most of the countries rely on the same outcomes like SNOT22, nasal polyp score, symptom scores, absence or presence of smell, they already have these things to get patients reimbursed. For example, the number of surgeries is also important. And so it's not so difficult because all over the world we use some similar uh, outcomes or um, assessments uh, to get our patient on a biological and being reimbursed. So I suppose from a personal level, you must be pretty pleased with, with the work that's gone into it and the outcomes that you've achieved. It's always nice that when you started studies 20 years ago and you use some outcomes that down, they are used all over the world. That's indeed a big pleasure for me. Well, many congratulations indeed. Thank you very much indeed to Professor Philippe Hevard. Thank you. Well, joining me now is Professor Saad Al Salah, who's Associate Professor Rhinology and Skull Based Surgery at King Saud University in Saudi Arabia. Very good to talk to you. Now, you were the lead author on this paper, Development of the Nasal Polyp Patient Assessment Scoring Sheet Tool. 
So why, from your point of view, was there a need to develop this end pass? Well, first of all, thank you for having me, and it's an honor. Uh, definitely, there was a need. Uh, CRS with MP has a significant burden, both on the patient as well as on national and international levels. And uh, with the introduction of endotyping, biologics, personalized medicine, and even value-based healthcare in the last few years, uh, the need for standardized assessment and even outcome measurement and monitoring of the disease itself was prudent. And uh, definitely the uh, the validated tools are available, but they're mostly fragmented in multiple ways. And each and every individual uh, author or researcher uses their own thing. So we had to, we wanted to actually create a comprehensive tool that enveloped all the uh, validated tools within one uh, uh, form or multiple forms and one tool. And that's the, the main driving force behind the project itself. So Professor Hevart was talking about bringing in together the subjective, the objective, and then the final tool really being six metrics. Just in terms of the development, was it easier or harder than you expected to develop the tool? It was definitely harder than expected. Uh, it took many months, uh, many meetings, many hours of a steering committee of around 12 or so people. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's uh, it, we started off with going all, through all the literature, all the evidence base, clinical guidelines, recommendations uh, by international experts and discussing that within the group multiple times. And then once we had that uh, uh, at least started, we, you know, in any consensus statement, uh, there's usually items that we go through and uh, we basically just rate the agreement between us. However, this is not a regular consensus statement. There are not only just the items being involved, there was the, also the wording, uh, the, uh, the sequence of each and every items within uh, the form itself, the layout of the form. And it was on not only one form, it was actually multiple forms. So this is why it was it had multiple layers of complexity to it. And once we agreed on all of that, uh, we added another layer of validation by inviting uh, five international experts who are pioneers within the field of outcome measurement uh, in CRS with MP, and they validated the content of the uh, tool itself. And the main challenge, I think the biggest challenge was to uh, keep it as easy as possible, as user-friendly as possible, for it to be integrated within regular clinical practice and for it to be used clinically as well as in research. And that was the main uh, challenge. <laughs> So obviously trying to get consensus amongst the panel was one challenge, but also then you, you, you saw your way through that, you got the final product. Um, for, when you got that final product, were you pleased with it? Because you mentioned then you added various things to it, like the follow-up form, for example, to collect patients' data after any intervention, and of course the patient response form. So, so multiple layers. It is, uh, nothing is ever perfect. Uh, as everyone knows. But we were definitely pleased with the final product uh, and it integrated multiple th multiple things within the form itself, hidden the with between the layers of the form itself. Uh, patient report outcome measures was uh, one uh, major component within the form itself, the most clinically uh, relevant ones at least. And other things like the EPOS CRS control criteria, for example, which is very important uh, just to assess control of patients the uh, APOS and euphoria biologic response criteria, all embedded within the actual form itself. Physical examination of the physician, just to follow the layout of how we actually see the patient. So the patients fill out the forms, bring it to us, and then we basically go over the physical examination part with the nasal polyp score, and then the investigations part, which uh, has basically the endotyping part, as well as the severity part with CT scans. So that's uh, the, th the third component. And then the last component would be the decision on how to treat the patient. And we also added a few novel things that weren't really within the rhinology literature a lot, uh, mostly on compliance measures, which is also an important aspect on follow-up. Uh, and when we follow up the patient, that's the second form. So we have the patient form, and the, the main form, which is the initial form of assessment when you see the patient, and then the follow-up form when we see the patients later on, and we added the compliance there as well. Uh, and very simply, uh, by another discipline, we just got another validated tool within that uh, tool itself to just to make sure that we're basically measuring all aspects and empowering patients as well as physicians. 
So if I was uh, to ask you to mark your own homework, what do you think are the strengths and the limitations of NPAS? Well, we went over some of the strengths that we talked about in being evidence-based um, and having all the recommendations, international expert opinions, and being user-friendly as well, and could be integrated within clinical practice as well as for research. So you can actually definitely use it for both. Uh, and I, I wouldn't see limitations. I usually say opportunities for improvement, and that's probably what uh, we'll, we look at. And in terms of how can we actually even streamline it even further, and I think uh, the main thing that we're exploring at this point is how to digitize and create digital solutions to even improve the flow, even creates visual uh, um, graphs and other things that you can follow the patients from both the patient aspect as well as the physician aspect, how to integrate it within the uh, electronic health records as well, and possibly later on in the future, even create global uh, disease registries. So that's one of the uh, opportunities for improvement. Another one that we we are thinking of, uh, you know, this uh, this uh, you know CRS with MP science is a rapidly evolving, moving target. So a lot of things are happening at the same time. And uh, we definitely need to update it every now and then. And this is something that will definitely be uh, updated within the next few years, whenever anything coming coming up uh, in literature. So finally, if I may ask you, how do you think patients will benefit? Well, it's uh, an important thing in, in terms of engaging the patients. And I think that's something that we always, uh, how to educate the patients on their disease itself, how to empower them and involve them within the decision-making process and how to actually make them make uh, informed decisions about their disease and increase uh, the uh, the responsibility and accountability on, for their own health. And by, you know, going in through the forms, seeing the the uh, the items being involved within the forms themselves, they actually fill out in the, in the waiting room and then see how this was interpreted uh, is interpreted within uh, the uh, or on the physician side in terms of how what they decide in terms of medications or anything you know you can see what he was before and what is he now and we can definitely we probably need to investigate another medication or another way of dealing with your disease at this point so when they see that see that they're uh, they're engaging in their own health uh, and uh, empowering uh, them or their own selves i think that definitely helps them and even increasing compliance uh, with their medications and with their treatment regimens. And that will definitely lead in empowering the physicians as well, uh, great, creating basically big databases and uh, possibly having great data-driven and evidence-based uh, uh, data uh, or uh, strategies and therapies. Well, thank you so much for your time. That's Professor Saad Asala there. Thank you so much. Well, that's it for this Euphoria News. Many thanks to my guests, to Professor Philippe Hevart and also Professor Saad Alsela. The paper is well worth a read, and here is the address where you can find it. Now, you can find more information about Euphoria and also register for the Euphoria educational events on the euphoria.eu website, where you can also sign up to receive the latest news via email. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media, on YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. Until next time, goodbye.